Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 327 for Tuesday, November 30th, 2021. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here back in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. Happy Thanksgiving, my brother. Happy post-Thanksgiving. Yeah, man. Yeah. It uh, was nice to nice to be with the family for the week last week. So, yeah, it was good. Cool. Yeah. I'm actually, uh, I have that uh, the standing gig I have, we're doing a holiday show. Mm. And I started putting together some people to play. So I've got... Our buddy Chris Breen will play keyboards. My buddy Russ from the House Rockers will play drums. My friend Josh is is the bass player. And then I started uh, inviting varied and sundry House Rockers to sit in on something, and it's turning into a pretty big thing. I know that the room is already sold out, which is kind of fun. That's fun. But I'm sitting here and started over over Thanksgiving. We can, you know, Christmas songs are a funny thing because you only pull them out, you know, for a couple of weeks a year, and so every year they're a little bit deeper into your psyche it's a little easier to dust them off every year but you still got some work to do to get them you know to get them ready i definitely don't know all the lyrics to jingle bells or you know santa claus or uh or uh here comes santa claus or you know some of the deeper ones you know you, but, you're uh, always saying that you want to have like a, a unique set list or at least a set list that is different from all the other bands in the area so i i, I assume that you're working up krampus carol by crater face right um, it's on the list. I don't know if I'll actually get to it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't have, I don't have any gigs coming up, but I do this weekend. We are going to the noise floor. And when I say we, I mean, bitter pill, uh, going to the noise floor to record the next record. So I think we've got, I don't know, 12 or 13 songs on the list. I have a question for you. Yeah. Why do you go to a studio anymore? I mean, you could do everything in your studio. Why go to a studio? It's a good question. And and even for this one, we talked about doing it here. The initial plan was to do it here. Uh, the band has earned uh, enough money from all the gigs that we played this summer to kind of want to have an expense, you know, <laughs> to, to, you know, so they were not taking it all as income. Um and so that was part of that allowed us the freedom to say, well, we could go into the studio and do this. And what that means is we don't have to do it all ourselves. Um, right. Recording an entire record in in a weekend would be very difficult if we were doing it ourselves, because one of us and it would likely be me would be doing some level of double duty of, you know, engineering, mixing, producing, yeah. and then also playing the drums, right? So, so so two quick things. One is the Beatles did it in a month, so I think you guys should be able to do it. Well, if you look... As, as we will talk about. Yeah, but if you look at that movie, there's a lot more than just the Beatles in that room, right? That's very true. And so... And time-wise, they, they, they crunched it down. They did. Right, right. Yeah, of course. But they did it in, yeah, it was a matter of weeks that they pulled it together. But that was writing and... Uh, you know, we've got these songs written. We did our weekend worth of of retreat, uh, the songwriting retreat separate from uh, going into the studio. And obviously we did the retreat here and we did record things here, which helped us realize, you know, it, it like it can come together that way. There's it, there, the recordings we did here are not perfect, but they weren't ever intended to be. They were just captures of these moments yeah. so that we wouldn't forget what we did. And, and they've been super helpful, at least for me, I know I'm kind of going through as we're, as we're getting ready for the weekend, but yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to it. It's nice to be able to go into the studio and just, you know, go bang drum and, and not yeah. have to think about anything else, which is really nice. So I, so. I want to get into this Beatles thing. Cause there's so much to, to deconstruct, but the uh, other thought is my friend, Nick told me that the best money that they ever spent when he went in, in his original band yeah. was hiring a good, a good producer, like someone who, really refined their songs, their chops, you know, sat on them for accountability, all that yeah. type of stuff. Have you ever worked with an actual producer? Um, I have. It, it's been a while. And I, 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 I agree with Nick that that's a, a very worthwhile 
person to have around. It's easy to think that you don't need them. It's easy to think you're the expert, right? Because, you know, they're your own songs collectively as the band. I mean, they might be individual people's songs. I didn't write anything on this upcoming Bitter Pill record, but, you know, they're they're the band's songs. So who else is, how, how could someone else tell you to make them better? And the answer is in many different ways um, and usually very good ones because you get that objective kind of thing. It's not their song. They are just there to make things better. And, uh, and it can work yeah. and it depends like, you know, a good, um, Chris at, at the noise floor is good at being a, at serving at that role when necessary. Uh, we, we definitely are our own producers on this stuff. That's certainly how it was for the last record. But, but it, there, there were moments where Chris stepped in and was like, okay, wait, 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 what are you doing on this song? Why are you doing this on this song? I think you're making a bad decision. Uh, and and that that is a helpful role to have filled, uh, especially when the band is not all in agreement on something. So, mm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, because, you know, I have a you make decisions in the moment like, oh, let's let's, you know, add harmonies here or not add harmonies here. You know, let's let's make this chorus smaller or bigger, whatever, you know, whatever. And somebody else to say. Wait, why are you doing that? That uh, yeah, I was, yeah. yeah, I don't I don't I don't get it. You know, and So I have I have a request for you. Yeah. And my request is this. So partially inspired by you, definitely inspired by the Fab 4 and what we watched over the weekend, but also uh, a reality of where I live where the original music is a is a pathway to different and better gigs. Oh, yeah. I really I am really in deep desire to express some original thoughts, uh, you know, and I, and I kind of want to do that with you on the show as it's a little bit of a kick in the pants because I'll, I, I'll have a little accountability, which sure. is helpful by myself, but I just really would like to kind of spend some time on the show, just kind of unpacking the journey with you and, uh, and, uh, and reality checking as I go along. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I am, I have had the pleasure and still have the pleasure of working with, many great songwriters over the years. Um, and, and I am not one of them. I, you know, I, I have written some songs, but it's, it's not, it's just never been, it's never been an interest of mine. I really like working with songwriters and arranging things, adding my ideas when appropriate. So I, I like the collaboration with a good songwriter, more than I like the process of it. Just, yeah. yeah. It just never, it just never became my thing, but, it, like anything, it is an exercise in repetition. You keep, you know, it, you're going to be awful at it at first. Keep doing it over and over and over again. And I say this to you as my friend, but also to anybody listening, just, you know, know that the first things you write are going to be probably pretty terrible. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I, we we watched that Get Back movie this weekend, or I, I watched most of it. I I'm about halfway through the third episode. Um, but, uh, but, you know, you can, you can see how the songs that the Beatles bring in from their early days are like, wow, these are awful compared to the stuff that they're creating now, well, yeah. you know, but even the things that the Beatles are, were creating, I say now, you know, then in, in the studio to then go and record, they didn't start out as great things. They, they had to be crafted and honed. And, and that's the part that you learn when you do this over and over again is, okay, you start with something and it it really is rough and you just work at it and and sometimes you have to throw it away because it never gets good enough but other times it does get good enough and you're like okay great it's like we can call this done and then move on and and that's a, I, that's a fun this. process I, yeah i consider myself a okay smart you know quasi intellectual person who's fairly verbose and i think the biggest wall i have is uh the thought that some deep emotional thing that I want to express is going to get dismissed as trite or, 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 you know, oh, the, derivative. You or, don't you know, have to I, worry about that. That's definitely going to happen. <laughs> 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 well, and, and that's part of it. When you take your song and, and, and finish it and deliver it to the world, it becomes theirs, right? Like the, the, when, when you hear a song, it could be a Springsteen song, a Beatles song or whatever, it, it doesn't matter, right? It could be a Cardi B song. You hear that with your own, you know, filter and lenses and life experiences and all of that. And it, it becomes about you 
in a way that it couldn't possibly have been about Cardi B, right? You know, and the same thing is going to happen when other people hear your songs is they're going to they they have to hear them with their own filter and their own lens. And Springsteen so, once said he writes with with purpose, like he's every word he is very careful about as though that process of what the world will do to to what you're expressing is in his mind. Not not that it guides what he's doing, but he under he understands the choices he makes in every word and every lyric and every chord change. Um, that is, and again, I I think about. I'm not a songwriter, but I would not give. I would not use that. My advice would be to don't do that <laughs> out of the gate. I mean, you got to get good at it before you could even begin to craft what someone else is going to hear in their head. Well, like, the, 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 do you ever see the movie Airheads? I think so. Yeah. Brendan Fraser. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's a line in that, you know, when they lock themselves in the recording studio and, and you know, the police are banging at the door yeah. and, and the main character, you know, Brendan Fraser is like, you know, I'm just screwed up enough that I might write a song that'll be an anthem for my generation. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But you don't know. Like, you you got to, yeah, do it a bunch. Just do it a bunch would be my I advice. I, I And I've I watched it. people you know, become better songwriters and, and like it, it it's, you got to get into your own head or out of your own head, whichever the right path is, but don't worry about other people's heads. Just well, tell I get, your story. I get it. Yeah. No, no, I get it. And, and uh, I want to talk about the Beatles and what the lessons were there, but we have a sponsor this week, right? We do. And I would love to, uh, yeah, I, I want to say one thing before we talk about our sponsor, it, it uh, just a quick thing is, um, Stephen Sondheim passed uh, mm. because it's relevant to this conversation. And it it's I mean, he had he lived a wonderful life. I was never a fan of Sondheim's work. It, it just never um, resonated with me. And I, somebody explained it to me. I mentioned that to a music director a number of years ago, and uh, he said something completely politically incorrect, but but probably quite truthful, where he said, oh, yeah, Sondheim is great unless you're a dancer, a drummer or black. And, uh, <laughs> and it's like, oh, yeah, actually, you know what? That makes sense. And uh, yeah, his music never resonated with me, but he, I mean, he's, he did fantastic work and, and deserves all the credit and success that he had and everything like all of that. But I did see a post today that I thought was worth sharing, especially as we're talking about learning to create your own work. And uh, it was uh, Mr. Dan Zak on Twitter wrote, one thing I often think about is how Sondheim's quote unquote genius phase began when he was 40 years old with the debut of Company. He was 41 for Follies, turning 43 for A Little Night Music, turning 49 for Sweeney Todd. He was in his 50s when he finished Sunday in the Park and Into the Woods. This is often seen as a young person's industry. And that if you are, you know, if, if you are older than 30, it's over, uh, especially in terms of your creative side. And it's just that's just not necessarily true. And it certainly wasn't true for Stephen Sondheim and and isn't true for a lot of people. In fact, you know, putting in the time, th there's that 10,000 hours thing, right? Where you just you get better because you've done it a lot. And so, no, th the best time to start was yesterday. And the second best time to start is today. So I just wanted to love it. share that about Sondheim. All right. I would, uh, I would love to talk about our sponsor now, if that's okay with you, my friend. Bring it. All right. Hey, look, the holidays are upon us, and you can give yourself and your wallet a break. You can enjoy delicious, affordable meals delivered to your door and ready to go in just six simple steps from our sponsor, Every plate, you know, meal planning can sometimes feel like one more item on an endless to do list. And every plate provides easy to follow recipe cards and pre portioned ingredients so you can spend less time prepping and cooking and more time enjoying good food with family or loved ones. We've done this recently. It's really fun because they give you those instructions and they are super easy to follow. And it makes it so everybody can be involved. One person's not just stuck prepping the meal for everybody else. You can let every plate plan, shop, and deliver everything you need to cook that delicious meal at a delightful price. And speaking of price, every plate is now $1.79 a meal when you use our coupon code GIGGAB179. 
I, this this is the amazing part. Like these meals are super affordable. It's about the same price as a cup of coffee and probably cheaper than that pumpkin spice latte, right? I mean, at $1.79 a meal, that's pretty good. Their menu is always changing and has fun stuff on it. I'm looking now, they've got garlic lime chicken fajitas, roasted bell pepper flatbreads, pork sausage stuffed peppers, scampi style scallop linguine, and the food really is as delicious as it sounds. And you can try every plate for just $1.79 per meal by going to everyplate.com and entering code GIGGAB179. That's G I G G A B 179 for $1.79 a meal. Get started with Every Plate for just $1.79 a meal by going to everyplate.com and entering code GIGGAB179. Our thanks to Every Plate for sponsoring this episode. All right. Let's. Um, $1.79? I know. Right? $1.79 a meal. You can't eat anything for $1.79. That's what I'm saying, man. It's a $1.79. Yeah. It's, no, it's, it, it, it's, yes. That's, that's why they're having us tell everybody about it. So, yeah. Amazing. Make sure to give you get code, get, get 179. Um, yeah. Let's talk about the Beatles. I, I, oh. I want to talk about Get Back. Uh, but I, I think the way to start this is let's share a little bit of personal uh, Beatles interest. Why, th- why we care about this movie. Because I, I, I think this is a, for many people, a difficult movie series, whatever you want to call it, a difficult, you know, nine hours of video to truly appreciate without first appreciating the Beatles. And and so I'm I'm curious, and I'm happy to answer this question first if, if you want a minute to think, but I think we should both answer the question, what was it that got you into the Beatles for yourself and and when did that happen? So uh, my journey with the Beatles is kind of interesting. I can be re- remember being about seven years old on a wintry day in New York, and Hey Jude was incessantly on the radio, and I hated that song. I mean, it became <laughs> sure? yeah. it became an earworm type thing at seven years old, and it was really awful. Um, and it wasn't until I started after I started playing music seriously, that some of these songs would come in. But some of them, you know, so many of those uh, Beatles songs were just not ones that, you know, beginning band guys could do. I mean, you could kind of do, you could kind of do Saw Her Standing There, I guess. But a lot of the stuff was hard. It was certainly beyond your range vocally. And so the Beatles were not as accessible as like the Stones were, right? Mm. You couldn't just, you couldn't just pick up a, an instrument and, and play Beatles songs and be, you know, feel like you're having a good time with it. They required, a, you know, a, another layer of, so they, I just kind of shelved them for a while. And then later in my life, as I started to appreciate songs as kind of a social mo- moving factor, you know, how music changes the world and started to think about those types of things. Um, I be, I, the Beatles started coming back into my consciousness, and, that, and I've been a huge Beatles fan, f- fascinated by their journey, you know, fascinated by the alchemy of four kids from a working class town could create that stuff, you know, that, that w- was bigger than the world, you know, fascinated by their impact politically and socially and all that type of stuff. And then as time goes on, just who writes album after album where every song on the album is that good? Yeah. I mean, just mostly the, the the quality of the output. And then you wrap it all together and the thought that it was you know, really quite a short story overall. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah. It, Less than a decade. Whole, yeah. Yeah. The whole story is just fascinating to me. The output is fascinating to me. You know, again, it's not, it, it didn't, it started out being bad earworm stuff for me, but everything that the Beatles meant to the world. And I think a lot of it was, you know, how often Paul would say, I mean, I remember, I remember when Lennon passed. Yeah. um, And I just remember that being, you know, even more than Elvis, that being, you know, the, how seeing how the world mourned for a musician was an amazing thing to me. And then, you know, McCartney's, you know, constant message when, when he was asked for all the years, you know, what What was the Beatles about? He goes, our message was simple. All you need is love. And he was sticking to that story as the, as the foundation of what he was trying to do in the world. And so that approach to it's not just grip and rip it. What you do has a meaning to people. It's not just only fun, although it is fun. 
Right. It is only rock and roll. Interesting. But I mean, it's more that the the whole vibe of what the Beatles did to the world. And uh, my friend Steve Strom said, definitely our our generation Shakespeare, our our century Shakespeare. You know, and then that that resonates with me quite a bit. And so, huh. music music as meaning is is what the Beatles had had come to mean to me uh, over time. I, I can see that. Sure. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. For I mean, I certainly was not alive when the Beatles were creating their music. So it was but it was most definitely introduced to me by my parents. They they my dad had all of the Beatle records and, and all of that stuff. And and we would listen to them together as sort of an active listening thing at, at times. He was also a, and still is a huge Stones fan. Uh, so we would listen to that stuff, too. The Beatles became mine twice in my life, <laughs> which which is which is interesting to think about. You know, it, it, when I say mine, it, I meant you know not my parents' music. Like I had my own connection to them. When I was, um, I had just started playing the drums, so I must have just been like fourteen or something. We wound up having this guy from Germany stay with us for about a month. Uh, he was doing effectively an internship at my dad's company. And uh, and so he or the company my dad worked at, it wasn't my dad's company, but uh, but he wound up staying with us for his time here in the States for a long time. And and he spoke English really, really well. He learned English through Beach Boys and Beatles songs, and he was a guitar player. And my brother had a guitar. He didn't bring a guitar with him from Germany, but my brother had a guitar. I had a drum set. And so one night, you know, he was like, well, we should, you know, play some Beatles songs. And I was like, uh, OK, you know, and I, I like, I, you know, I knew the Beatles from hearing them from my parents. But so we started playing Beatles songs and this became very quickly became a nightly thing for about three weeks. Like it didn't take long for this to start. So this became a really intense sort of, you know, journey into Beatles music for a very, very, you know, green drummer. And. And there was one afternoon where we had a, a piano player. Uh, it was a kid who was maybe three or four years older than me at the time. And I assume he still is. Uh, and we were all in the house. And so I set up my drums in the living room, which is where our piano was. And we played Beatles songs and really got like it, it became a thing uh, for, again for a very short period of time. And, and then he went back to Germany to continue his education. Obviously that was, you know, that was the end of that. And then, you know, so that, that was the the first foundation and the second round of it was when I joined the responders uh, when I moved to Connecticut in whatever it was, 2000, 2001 and started playing lots of Beatles songs with, uh, with Keith Marin, who is a huge Beatles fan. And so, it, you know, digging back into them with the experience that I had gained in the, you know, 20 years in the middle or whatever it was, I was like, oh, wow, there's so much more to these songs. And so for me, it really was about the music and and trying to figure out, you know, just how those grooves work and the harmonies and how everything came together. And like you said, you know, every song is a hit. Like they, they just wrote great melodies and and great chords. And like they, they weren't just like you said, grip it and rip it, play the, you know, play the one, four, five and go. Of course, there are a couple of those, but but by and large, they were really working on crafting their songwriting and it's because they were you know songwriters from when they were kids and they really worked on yep. that so so that was my introduction to the beatles and and the foundation into which i stepped with uh watching this get back thing that the first for those of you there, there will almost certainly be spoilers here and i don't even know if we call them spoilers but but there are things in this that um, that we will be talking about. So if you don't want to hear about it, skip, we put chapters into our show. You can just skip right over it. It's fine. Um, your podcatcher should show you the chapters, but, uh, that first episode was really a test of, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it was, I saw a friend of mine post something on Facebook. Like, even if you're a diehard Beatles fan, don't beat yourself up. If you find yourself grabbing your phone to kind of do other things. Uh, while you're watching, because it really was, you know, Peter Jackson took, what, 60 hours of footage or something and whittled it down to nine or so. Uh, but it's Peter Jackson. You knew it was going to be long. It's how he works. What he showed us in the, especially that first episode was 
how boring it is to hang around a band that's starting to write songs and like work things out. Even a band that already was, you know, successful on a global scale. Uh, it was still the same sort of, yep, we're just going to hang out and I've got some ideas and you've got some ideas and we're going to kind of run them through the ringer. And uh, obviously there's, you know, the interpersonal stuff that happens, but, um, but, it, but it, you know, it, it's all, like you said, it's the movie is, it's 60 hours of footage compressed to nine, but it was all filmed over like a three and a half week period or something. Right. So it, it really is just a snapshot into this. It's not their entire career. But it is effectively what happens in every band when you're kind of going through this is you, it's just boring. Well, um, so hang, hang on to that every band thought because that's, yeah. I think, really r relative here. I, I would actually back up a little bit and, and actually say 90% of the people are going to come into this with some appreciation, knowledge of who the Beatles are and, and, and what the Beatles were. So to me, you know, the door opens and this begins, A – the video is stunningly beautiful. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, they were filming a movie. Right. Yeah, yeah. But whatever's been done to preserve, you know, whatever they had or whatever, you know, video magic had to be do done to prepare it for digital. I, I don't know. You know, that's not my world. But, you know, I know it was done was done originally for television though it was it was not yeah done but in so the was all that quality. like all that doors footage like those cameras back then those video cameras took great footage it just okay cool you, you know it's just like yeah i remember when i saw that that doors movie that was the, essentially the documentary and it was like wait did, like that's really jim morrison like how do you have footage of him that looks that good and it's like well, yeah the, the cameras do that like we but just didn't have any way of doing sound. it yeah. The sound is remarkable. Yeah. I mean, the sound is, and actually, I just recently read something with um, with uh, Michael Lindsay Hogg, Michael Hogg Lindsay, Michael Lindsay Hogg, Lindsay Hogg, yeah. and and yeah, and he was you know saying how Jackson had at his disposal, you know, sound uh, technology that that he didn't have back then when he made Let It Be. Absolutely, that, you know, yeah. it's really useful for telling the story. So the first thing is, you know. There are the Beatles in glorious, beautiful, pristine color, gl glorious, beautiful, pristine sound. So we start there and, and you're like, holy cow, this is really happening. But then you're right. They get in a circle and they start figuring out what are we going to do with our lives? What are we going to do with our time? What are we going to do to make this, you know, album and show yeah. or, you know, songs for a show, you know, happen? And in that, and I've already read quite a bit about how, yes, it's not for the faint of heart. You know, it's really the inside baseball crowd that's going to appreciate that. But I would say anybody listening to this show who is in a band, it is so incredibly relevant on so many levels. It's incredibly relevant because, A, it's the Beatles sitting in a circle figuring out songs. And yep. you know what? They often sound like crap. I mean, like, yeah. uh, right, except for, and I'm going to go back and back on this except for McCartney, where everything that comes out of his mouth, everything that comes out of his fingers, to me, sounds on a different level. Every riff he's trying to figure out vocally, every time he sits down at the piano, you don't hear it. Like, do you ever sit down on an instrument and not play a wrong note? <laughs> I don't it, hear very many wrong notes as they're just fiddling around. So. Yeah, no, he was like, well, to what you, to the gist of what you're saying, it it's good. F I, f I liked seeing how the the perfection that we know of as these you know final products of beat that, that we call Beatles songs did not start that way, right? They 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 had to come together, no pun intended, and they had to work out the harmonies, and they weren't always good. Like the harmonies were kind of crap sometimes. It was like, oh wait wait, wait no, you got to fix that, and the Except you know the McCartney the grooves and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. But but you know we. We were seeing again, and, and this is this is sort of the thing that I, I think it's important to remember watching this is this was a snapshot in time. And it was very clearly a period of time where McCartney was like just firing on all cylinders in terms of his songwriting. Now, interpersonal stuff, he was doing a terrible job, right? Like he really was screwing things up. But it was because... A, he was, he was just like, songs were just pouring out of him. And it is amazing to watch songs literally sort of pour out of him through instruments uh, at, at times. And it's cool to see what his process is where he has a, you know, a chord structure and a melody and he just sings gibberish 
until you know words start to come but the melody is is there he that like that's how he gets this stuff out and and that's a fascinating thing to watch not every songwriter is the same in that regard obviously and and it's just, just interesting to see oh this is how mccartney sort of forces these things he wills them into existence uh, right. by by just you know singing gibberish of course, that worked for Michael Stipe. He never had to actually write the lyrics. He just kept, kept with the gibberish. But seriously, like like that. But looking at it and comparing the two, it's like, oh, you can sort of see like, oh, these guys have similar approaches. They just, you know, they like a melody. They convey a feeling and then worry about whatever it's going to be. But like like when he was working on uh, Carry That Weight with Ringo, he had the chorus and then he was like, oh, you know, so the verse just has to be about some weight, but it's got to be something that, you know, to like what you were saying about Springsteen before, it needs to be something that that is just going to be like an every man's trouble. Like, you know, I went out and I got drunk and my wife's mad at me and my head hurts and I'm carrying a weight and I realize it's my head, you know, and then boom. And so he's like, oh, we'll figure out how to make that into a verse later. But, but interesting, that balance is really interesting because they start with gibberish. Yeah. But then he drill actually drills down. There's one song where he's talking about how, no, we can't say it that way because that would be derivative. That's already been done. Yeah. So there is actually a, there is a refinement process. It's all but a refinement what, process. That's right, right. all but it the, is. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it starts, it started with jamming. And and, and that's yes. so interesting. Yeah. And like I said, it's, it's the Beatles in a circle, just playing. And sometimes they just need to play, you know, an old, an old fifties rock and roll song to go, just get the juices, get the juices going. flowing. Nothing. And, and, and they were playing like not just having fun. And now that, that was nice to see. There were so many stories about how they oh, hated, sure. they hated each other during these sessions. And I remember when the, um, the, when Giles Martin did those, the, the let it be release, which had a lot of the audio footage from, or the audio recordings, the kind of mid takes of all that stuff. And he was like, you yeah, know, I like I'm not hearing a band that's fighting here. I'm hearing a band that's having a lot of fun. And those audio outtakes definitely showed that, as did these. Now, there was also, uh, you know, strife happening. <sighs> this is that snapshot in time, right? We, we it's easy to watch this and forget it's easy to watch this, especially the end of episode one, where George just says, I'm leaving, which was handled a little bit ham fistedly, I thought, by. Peter Jackson, because we didn't get quite enough of the buildup to that. It was just like, wait, yeah. you're, you're out. Like what? The, like we knew this is happening, but like you got to give us a little something here. But that wasn't the first time that kind of thing had happened, right? Ringo quit in the middle of recording the White Album. These things do become pressure cookers, and there is like you have to go in. And I, like this weekend, I know I'm going in with trying to remind myself, don't like pick your battles. Right. Is mm -hmm. is is how it is. And I think your battles is the wrong the, the wrong mindset, to be perfectly honest, because it should be no battles. But it you know, listen, uh, collaborate, don't get stuck in your own ideas. And and so, you know, this had happened before. It happened again. This was but but the issue was that, you know, here was this songwriting duo of Lennon and McCartney that had been working together literally since they were kids. George was the side man. Right. He was there to serve their songs. And yeah. and then and and then suddenly we're seeing George coming into his own as a songwriter. But he's a, a you know, he's a team of one. There's no room for him there in this. Right. And and they you know, Paul was. Paul was doing a terrible job of being the the band leader who was trying to be the one sort of mediating all the problems, but also the one saying, yeah, but like I'm right. Like they were definitely missing Brian Epstein at this point. So this well, is the essence of why actually I really I really wanted to talk about this. Because yeah. In that is is a, a really fantastic lesson. So because I've Paul wasn't the, always the band leader, I think that's the other thing to remember when you come into this, right? John was was the band leader of the Beatles, uh, as I understand it, uh, basically until they touched down in America, and that overwhelmed John. And Paul was like, "Well, somebody needs to be the band leader," and so he, right, so he stepped in, and we're seeing the evolution of that here. I agree with you completely. So, and I've seen. Other musicians, other band leaders say Paul was a jerk and, you know, how, how dare he be that way to George and all those types of things. I Here's my reflection on that. And um, again, I th I think this is largely a story about Paul. I mean, I, I mean, yes. clearly, you know, his role in all of this and, you know, for people who really dig deeper, you know, they 
are trying to understand where everybody else's um, frame of mind was. I know myself, I was really surprised how passive John was for the first six hours of, of this documentary, yeah. like, yeah. like not passive aggressive, like not checked out, but just didn't really offer a whole lot. Right. No, this was, he, I, he was, his creative mindset was elsewhere. Right. And, and so he was, he, he was just letting Paul, Paul was poor, like ideas were just pouring from him. There was no more room in the room for other right. people's ideas. There was just so much. And, and the thing, I think there was one moment, I think it was where, um, they were working on, I think it was, let it be, it might've been get back where you see this look on George's face. Like, okay. I, like, I'm not happy that we, we have to work on Paul's song again, mm. but also like the look communicated, but it's an amazing, like, this is a hit. Like, of, <laughs> of course we have to work on this. Maybe it was, Oh, darling too. It might've been actually, Oh, darling. And, it was like, you know, it was this, he sort of had to give in to like, well, yeah, obviously this is the best thing for us to work on because this song's freaking amazing. Like, well, it's important know. to remember that it is a snapshot into a point in time that is a sum of, you know, four guys that have gone through something that no one else had ever gone through before, right? right? Yeah, well, and My they- interpretation- They didn't want to do this. This was, the whole thing was Paul wanted to play a gig. Like that was, right? That was, that was the entire driving force behind- this no one else was like we have to do a thing paul was the only one and he was trying to keep the beatles together and wait wait, wait stop that's the part right there right I, yeah. it seemed like seemed like he was like you don't really get a sense where ringo's head was on things but ringo had walked out once right he was george's on the other side of it <laughs> yeah george's frustrations were not anything new and so you got to remember that that dynamic had played in but it seemed like even though Paul was the most fertile creative mind at the time, with George being a, a, you know not too distant second, but yeah. but 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 Paul was doing it because he wanted the Beatles to get. Paul didn't Paul didn't say I'm going to go start a solo career. He was trying to keep the band together. And it, and it, to me, the whole story is uh, Paul was from a different universe, right? Like like even when they're like I'm saying when even when they were jamming. He is musical in everything he does. John didn't strike me that way. George somewhat, but George seems somewhat effective. And Ringo doesn't say enough to really let you know where Ringo's mind was. I'm not going to say that's positive or negative, but but I get the sense, and you know, I work with people like this. Paul was in a different plane, right? Yeah. And so, especially you're right. Then it like right. in that one period, yeah, for sure, yeah. So if you've ever worked with someone who is on that different plane, and I actually saw it as as Paul was part English gentleman, part fighting his instincts, part trying to you know keep the band together as he was trying to sell his ideas. You ever you know what yeah. I'm saying? Like yeah, no, he was in such he, a different place. Yet, and it wasn't that he that he disliked George or or really it, it was more like how do I get these ideas out of my head? How do I get this band that I love so much to collaborate and bring these ideas to life? They needed oh, Epstein. They needed someone they, the four of them that trusted equally because Paul trying to play that role of, of the, you know, the, the cheerleader, while he also knew that his ideas were the right ones to pursue, it doesn't work. Like <laughs> You can't, yeah. like it's very, or it's very difficult. Wonder, yeah. I mean, he was young too. Producers. Like, you know, yeah. We were talking about producers earlier, and I, another thing that comes out of this is, what did Glenn Johns do for a living? I mean, he, he offers nothing. Yeah. Was he just a, a technical engineer? Because he doesn't seem to be involved in their creative process at all. And again, it's the Beatles, so you know that's a tough job. But you and I could sit here and say they really would have benefited from someone being a or, – or, or, or literally, did no one have – the credentials, the chops, the trust to assert themselves into that role. Well, once, they, think, once they brought George Martin in more in that process, like he definitely took on that role, but Glenn Johns did not at all. Yeah. yeah no, he was the engineer. It, it like, right. that's how it communicated to me watching this, yeah. uh, you know, useless. But yeah. It was, I mean, it was fascinating. You know, the John, was a, a great consigliere to Paul and held him accountable. Right. I mean, there was that moment where, you know, neither John nor George are in the, in the, uh, you know, at the studio or whatever, I guess, they, I guess they were at, at the movie studio at this point. And, you know, Paul says to Ringo, and then there were two 
And as soon as he says it, you can see the tears well up, not only in his eyes, but in Ringo's eyes. And they just, you know, they sat there for a while. Yeah. It's a snapshot of four kids. I mean, they're, they're what, 28 years old at this point? Yeah. Yeah. 20, 28 years old. You know, the, think of what they've accomplished and what they've been through and what the residual emotional baggage is to get them to this point. And this is why, actually, for those who are band guys, if you think about the residual frustrations and, and uh, you know, buildup of emotions that you have with your band, this is why, to me, those scenes of them sitting around being silly and, you know, just playing their old favorite songs to kind of get some mojo going is incredibly useful, yep. you know, to, to a reminder, set the stuff aside. We, when we do this thing, we're, we're really good you know, what did, what did some the, of the parts, what, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. What did, is it McCartney or Leonard who said, you know, we've always been in our best when, when our backs are to the wall. That's it was, when, it was, that was Lennon who was, when McCartney was saying, man, you, you know, we got to get this together. We have a, you know, we're going to put on this show. And yeah, it was Lennon saying, you know me, I work, I work best when, when I've got a deadline effectively. And he did, man. And he was absolutely. like on that rooftop. He was dynamite. Even, yeah. I haven't, I, I mean, though, I've, I haven't watched, I haven't seen them on the roof yet. I mean, I've seen them getting ready to be on the roof, but uh, I haven't, that's, that's the part of the. The thing I haven't watched. I mean, obviously, I've seen some of the footage. Oh, yeah. I'm very much looking forward to it. But like it's watching this is a journey to get there. And and really, the first episode, you just got to suffer through it um, because there's parts of it to suffer through. But there were there were fascinating things like when, you know, Billy Preston just like happened to be in London and, you know, they brought him into play. And and then there was that one day where he couldn't be there because he was in London for whatever it was he was supposed to be doing. And uh, that's when John said to the band, like, I, I want Billy to be the fifth Beatle. Right. And and Paul stepped in as band leader and was like, my gosh, like we went from, you know, four to three to two back to four. And now you want to add five. Like we got enough trouble with the four of us. Like, no, yeah. figure out a way to pay him. It's fine. Like, <laughs> you know, um, but but, I, you know, there was a thing, a very functional thing I thought that was interesting, which reminded me about. Something you said a couple of years ago on the show, we were talking about sound and rehearsal and you said, you know how rehearsal is, is just, is just survival mode. You just get through it sound wise. And that was preposterous to me at the time. <laughs> like, no, you ha- that's the, that's where it should sound its best. And uh, Paul was talking to George Martin as they were getting set up in their own studio at, at Savile Row And Paul said something to George. He said, you know, a great sound in here will improve what we do. It's sort of at the beginning of episode three. Mm -hmm. And George is like, George Martin was like, okay, I got you covered. I I will fix this, you know, because they they had what happens to everyone. The sound that got to the point where they had the drums in the PA, like, you know, it's like too much. That's not that huge of a space. You don't need to amplify the drums. You, you, You know, it's. But that's what was happening. And and George was like, OK, let's let's rewind back to how we've had it in the past. And like, I just thought it was interesting watching them go through all of that same stuff. The one thing that that they went through that we do not one of the many, many things that they went through that we do not was uh, in the same episode. George Martin said to them, remember, guys, tape is costing you two shillings per foot. Now, they had more money than they knew what to do with, and they didn't really care. But it was, you know, Glenn Johns kept saying, do you want me to erase that take? You do want me to erase that take? And in today's world, that's just crazy talk. Like, right. why would you erase a take of anything? But, you know, tape was two shillings a foot. That's why. <laughs> and if you're recording well, to analog in, in today's world, if you're recording to tape, it's still expensive, super expensive. So, right. yeah. Yeah, some of the, the technical things that are happening in 1969 are just amazing. How yeah. like can you turn the can you turn the bass up on your guitar a little bit, or or can you play a little softer? Right, like yeah. some of the lack of actual technical tools that they had are are it's remarkable. But what's even more fascinating is as you listen to this, the this this what you hear and know at the Beatles is not nearly as much a creation of the studio as it is what was in their fingers and coming out of their voices Yes, is was the real thing. I mean, yeah. th- there was a couple of scenes where um, I'm hearing a bass and I wasn't seeing a bass, but they show John playing something that looked like a guitar because it had six you know tuning pegs on it. And I had to look it up because that didn't look right. And, and sure enough, it was a six string bass and it was, 
it was the bass line in 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 some of the more famous songs, right? Yeah. And it it is again, alchemy is the is the best thing I can say is that is that whatever the combination, that set of skills created things that are just unmatched in human history. I would say, you know, they just it and it and it's literally what was coming off of their fingers and out of their voices that created some of those things. Absolutely. Just amazing. And the yep. most of which to me was Paul again, Paul. Oh no, he, he's the star of this by, by, by far. He is the star of this. And right. in an amazing way, like it really, we like this just happened to capture, not that the guy hasn't always and still isn't a fantastic songwriter, but I, I feel like this was ca- capturing him at certainly one of his peaks because it was just amazing watching these moments where he just willed things like get back and, and let it be. And well, you see get back actually go from him yeah. doing chord riffs on a, on his honer bass, right? With a melody. Literally. And then it's like, Oh wait, let's fix this and just shove and it in about into 45 the seconds. You hear get back, get born. And that, that actually is probably the most remarkable thing. Yeah. I would also say Friggin when guy. George brings in all things must pass and I me mine, you oh, are actually yeah. stopped in your tracks about how gorgeous those songs are. Again, just you could have put him with a iPhone, yeah. you know, and just turn the microphone on. It and basically did. Song. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, um, I, one one last thing I um, because I think there's a there's a cautionary tale here that is uh, a bit misleading watching this movie. I always had heard that Yoko's presence in the studio and the Beatles was something that contributed to the decline of them. And if that were if that is true, I saw none of that here. Certainly there were a few peppery moments, maybe where Yoko was a little bit in the way. But by and large. She was not a distraction to them. And and it's obvious that in order for John to be there again during that three week period, Yoko must had had to be with him. Right. But she she was like watching it. I'm like, there she is all the way through. But like John's still participating. He's still locking eyes with Paul when they're figuring out harmonies. Like there's just not that many moments where Yoko gets in the way. And finally, in the, the as as the third episode was beginning, it hit me. It was like, wait a minute. I think a huge part of the reason that John having his girlfriend there wasn't a problem is it wasn't just the four Beatles plus John's girlfriend. It was the four Beatles plus about 15 other people, one of whom happened to be John's girlfriend, right? Well, I, I see it a little bit differently, Dave. And I'll tell you, although McCartney does have that amazing line where he says, yeah. You know, in 50 years, someone's going to read the Beatles broke up because Yoko sat on someone's amp, which I, which is right. the funniest line which in the is whole a, thing. I, yeah. Yeah. But again, if it's me and you in a band and there's any tension or even no tension, if one guy brought his significant other, one guy who sat right next to him as you're working through some of these things, I I agree with you. There's no indication and everything that I've read was like, it wasn't a problem. It wasn't I just don't a problem. Know how, how could it not be? A well, I think it's the just, reason it's, it's I think the answer to your question is because Yoko was one that because the people who weren't the Beatles outnumbered the people who were at every point in time. There were literally cameras on them. Right. I mean, like, that's how we get to see this. So this was not them being private. This was them trying to act like they were being private under a very, very large microscope, <laughs> you know, and I, I think that's why having her and all of the other people there, I mean, everybody effectively had an assistant of sorts at times. And Yoko was basically John's, you know, uh, uh, assistant. He was John. She was John's person that was, that was there. And so I, I don't like it. I think that's why. And my cautionary tale is don't watch this and think, oh, it's no big deal to have a friend show up at rehearsal with me, it won't distract things. If it didn't distract the Beatles, it won't distract me or whatever. I don't know what that pro- what that thought process would look like, but it will. Like it, adding any one person to a rehearsal room completely changes the dynamic. But when you've added 15 people to the rehearsal room, well, one more doesn't really make a difference. Uh, I guess that makes sense. You know, it all depends on what that one more does. Sure, like, again, but if, she wasn't if, getting involved that's clear. In like she, clear. It, when there was a, a discussion about songs or whatever, she stayed out of it. And it was Although, that, that was amazing that, that yeah, she but kept some of the yaps where they're jamming and she's doing her kind of yeah. you know, vocal screaming thing. I that they like I mean, they seem to like that. 
Like they I were didn't get it. they were talking about that jam where it was was it John on drums and and Yoko yeah. right you know and it was just like this this caterwauling thing it was awful to listen to but they were having a blast all of them were and so yeah I I just but just like don't watch this and think oh it's okay to bring one person bring fifteen people that's better than one <laughs> yeah. either we're gonna do this publicly or we're not well we're not yeah but 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 when somebody starts bringing their girl like I was in a band uh, for a while and this one guy would bring his wife to our house and she would just sit there in our rehearsal room and it would be the band plus her. And she was fine. She, like I got along with her. It was never a problem, but it was just weird that here, like, especially when there were those moments where it was like, we're going to negotiate something here. We're going to collaborate, but it's, you know, you have your idea. I have mine. We need to figure out either, you know, one of them is better than the other, or there is something that combines the two that's better than either. And to have someone with, Someone in there, you know, one of the band members with someone in their corner and now in those moments and no one else with that. Yeah, that that gets weird. But this didn't get weird because everybody had someone in their corner, multiple people. I think that's the I think that's why it wasn't as much of an issue as I expected it to be. You know, I mean, you hear the stories over the years and start to believe them. So I don't know. Well, I, I would just say net net for people who listen to our show. If you start out with the most famous band in the world sits in a sits in a circle, and the way that they jam and the way that the, it it stimulates a creative process is a masterclass for anybody. It is. It, it is. It yeah. is so worth your nine hours. Yeah. You know, and then and then the you know you get the payoff. Like the culmination of this pain is a joyful performance, which, which is, is the one thing I haven't watched yet. <laughs> So I have I have I have paid my dues and now I will enjoy the uh, the spoils of them. But yeah. Yeah. No, it's good. That's good. It was great. All right. Well, that's I think that's a good show for today, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we could got- we could probably go on nine more hours and, and kind of dissect every part of this. And, and, you know, I personally would love to hear. Like I said, I've seen a lot of musicians like take Paul to task about what a jerk he was, what a jerk he was to George. I just saw it more as a a creative genius who was trying his best to get his ideas communicated as politely as he could and keep his band together. Like, again, you know, remember, these songs are amazing. Like if, if Paul had had it with the Beatles and all the drama and he wanted to go out, he probably felt he could probably probably be pretty successful as a solo. Yet he wanted the Beatles to continue. Uh, He knew he knew that John would make some parts of his songs better. And he was not wrong. He, I mean, he was a hundred percent right about that. Like that process did make his songs better. And you saw moments of that, uh, probably not enough of them. I would say. I agree. Yeah, I agree. So anyway, I'd, I'd love, we get a lot of emails lately and, you know, I know there's a little traffic on our Facebook page and like that. Let's talk about the Beatles. Cause there's so many lessons. So if you're listening to this, if, 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 and you've watched you know, six or nine hours of it, and you've you know come across anything that really resonates with you. Share it with us because I can imagine we're gonna we're gonna come back on this topic because yeah. there's just so much to learn. There, there's a lot there. Yeah, this will be a foundation of of many different pockets of conversation over the over the next Agreed. couple of years on this show. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for listening, folks. Thanks for hanging out with us for the last almost hour. Make sure to check out everyplate.com. Dollar seventy nine per meal by going Dollar to. I know everyplate.com with. Code GIGGAB179. You could always be performing with a full tummy of good food. I love it. See you next week. 